Welcome back, brothers and sisters. I trust you had a good break. And uh, we're going to continue on today. Yesterday, we were almost finished with the Old Testament. And I thought for a moment we were, but then I remembered that I had promised you we would come back to the book of Daniel and take that up along with the prophets. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about Daniel and the concept of the Son of Man, which comes becomes very, very important later on in the New Testament. So Daniel was written from uh, 605 to 530 while he was living as an exile in Babylon. Remember, Isaiah had prophesied, Jeremiah had prophesied, and the people had continued to rebel and were taken into captivity in Babylon. Uh, Daniel himself lived there. And Daniel reminds those who are in exile with these words, the Most High God is sovereign over the kingdoms, notice that plural, over the kingdoms of man, chapter 521. The sovereign rule of God, of course, has already been anticipated in that wonderful story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego back in chapter 3. God had given to these men special wisdom and insight, and uh, then of course they were threatened by King Nebuchadnezzar, and they responded this way, no matter what you do, King Nebuchadnezzar, you will lose. Even if we die, you still will lose. Why? because our God is the king. Their words and their actions clearly testify to the fact that God is not bound by a temple. We talked about that yesterday also, how the uh, pagans around would have all kinds of gods and then they would put them into that temple. That's where he was. But no, God is not bound to a temple, not to his cities. But he is the God over all people and over all nations. God is also God over life and death. They believed that somehow, even if God does not save them, even that fact would not separate them from their faith. Think back to the story of Abraham and Isaac. Abraham believed and it was credited to him as righteousness. So these three people in exile surrendered their lives fully because they trusted that their God was the sovereign God. And in doing that, they anticipated also the prayer of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, not my will, Father, but thy will be done. But who sees? Who takes note of what they are doing or saying? Nebuchadnezzar, the king. The king sees the one who is his king. The one who challenged God comes to see God. The one who thought that God could not save Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is forced to call God the Most High God. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God, he says, come out, come here. The prideful Nebuchadnezzar is now humbled low in front of his people as we read on in chapter 4. Then we read his final words. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the King of heaven for all his deeds are right and his ways are just and he is able to humble those who are filled with pride. Daniel prophesies that the Messiah would establish a kingdom of righteousness, justice, and peace. See Daniel 7, 13, 14. In other words, to say Daniel is talking about this Messiah who will bring a new Eden. Eden will be restored. And Daniel points to the ascension of the Lord 
as vindication of his suffering and death. The Son of Man will come again with the clouds of heaven and be given, what? Dominion, glory, and a kingdom in which all people will serve him. Now, then you come to chapter, <coughs> excuse me, chapter 9, the 70 weeks. And here's where it gets a little bit difficult to follow. People agree that there are three periods listed here, three groups, seven weeks, 62 weeks, and then one week. But the purpose of those weeks then becomes rather vague and many people differ about them. Most commentators agree that the beginning point of this 70 week time is from the time that Artaxerxes decreed in 445 to allow Jerusalem to be rebuilt. But then what? Then there are as many different opinions as there are weeks, it would seem. What are we to make of that? What are we to make of it? The truth is, we have a choice. How do we end that seven weeks time? What is that last time that's de depicted there? Is it the time that Jesus talked about in Matthew 24? Is it the time that Paul talks about in Thessalonians 2? What is that time? Now, we could spend a lot of time. We could spend a great deal of time talking about that. And many people have, and many people have spent a lot of time arguing, and Christians have been divided over that time. But this much is clear. I was saying we could spend a lot of time arguing about it, but that would not get us very far. This much is clear that there would be a long, difficult road to travel before the God of glory and his saints would return. That's clear in chapter 8. There would be trials and temptations, not just for 70 years, but Daniel says in chapter 9, 24, 70 times 7. But even that leaves a question. How do we interpret 70 times 7? Is that a literal 490? Or is that the same kind of imagery that Jesus used when he says we should forgive each other 70 times 7? So if someone sins against you 490 times, you forgive him. But if he does it 491 times, then you don't forgive him? Of course not. Jesus is talking about a great amount of forgiveness. The number seven, you know, is so important in the writings of the scripture. So we must understand that we're talking about a period of time that could be a long way off from the time of Daniel. But what we do know is this. God will triumph and he is the king and judge over all as we read in chapter 12. Now much of how people understand this depends on whether or not we consider this literature of Daniel's book to be apocalyptic similar to the literature in Revelation or historical. And that's often where the difference lies. So we won't go into any more detail there. There's a little bit more that I've written for you on uh, your notes. However, um, I'll leave you to think about that and pray about that as you go further. The question is, uh, how, are all, how are all these things predicted by Daniel? How are they going to happen? And who will be this king, the king after God's own heart? 
That question is raised in a very similar way by others who are considered among the minor prophets. For instance, Zechariah says that the one who is coming, that king of whom Daniel is talking about, that one who is coming will come riding on a donkey, bringing salvation. Malachi, written after Daniel, says this, surely the day is coming. But then we know there was that great period of silence, 400 years between the Old and the New Testament. 400 years, that time of waiting that we reflect upon during the season of Advent when we sing, come, come thou long expected Jesus. When will that happen? Who will the Messiah be? As we turn to the New Testament, we will see how the coming of Jesus fulfills the promises of the covenants. He is the true King of Israel. All the threads that we have been talking about are now getting woven together and you will see that they are reflected in the Gospels, reflected in the coming of Jesus. The covenant, the seed, the kingdom, all the nations, the shepherding, all those things come together in Jesus. Of his coming, Albert Walter says, the coming of Christ is the climax of the whole history of redemption as it is recorded in the scriptures. The rightful king has established his beachhead in his territory and he calls on his subjects to press his claims ever farther into the world that he has made. The Apostle John announces this radical coming by returning to the language of Genesis 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by him, and without him was nothing made that was made. God's plan from the very beginning, namely to establish his kingdom, his reign on earth, now becomes further unfolded and is revealed in his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus is king, the one who was from the beginning with God. But now he humbles himself. The word became flesh and lived with us, full of grace and truth to redeem his people and to restore his great creation. Consider also such places as Colossians 1, 5 to 17, or Hebrews 1, 10 to 12. By the cross, we will see in Jesus that it is by the cross that God will restore his kingdom. Even a cursory survey of the gospels indicate that the concept of the kingdom of God was very prominent in the teachings of Jesus. In fact, there are more than 60 references to the kingdom in the Gospels. The Lord spoke often of the kingdom of God, or as he refers to it in Matthew's Gospel, the kingdom of heaven. And we are going to focus mostly on Matthew's Gospel as we look through the coming of Jesus and how that is the turning point in the restoration from the fall. Matthew uses the phrase the kingdom of heaven 30 times and only three times the kingdom of God. And many people have again discussed and even argued about the differences. But to me, the best concept is this. Matthew is writing to the Jewish people for the Jewish people, and he himself is a Jewish person. 
and he would seek to avoid the name God as much as possible. And therefore, it's quite possible that he refers so frequently to the kingdom of heaven rather than the kingdom of God. Ritterboss, in his second chapter, discusses this matter a lot more. Jesus came preaching the kingdom. Jesus' message as he began his ministry is very clear. For instance, in Mark 1.25, the time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Or consider his, what we call, inaugural address, his first preaching ministry in Luke 4, 18 and 19. He indicates there that righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit are coming. That's his job, to bring those things into the world. And when Jesus says the kingdom of God is near, he is saying that with his coming rule, the rule of God has arrived in a very concrete way. God himself is here. Emmanuel, as Isaiah had prophesied, and as the baby in Bethlehem was named. That Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament, the one through whom God's kingdom will come, is made very, very clear to us in the Gospel of Matthew. So let's take a closer look at the way in which Matthew describes Jesus as the Christ, the new Israel, and in many ways portrays him to be the one who is truly the king of kings. Consider, first of all, the genealogy of Jesus as it is recorded in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1. Matthew goes back 14 generations to Abraham, the father of the Hebrew people. By dividing this into three groups, of 14 generations, Matthew presents Jesus as the culmination of the Old Testament covenant promises to which the prophets had pointed. He is declared to be the son of Abraham, the son of the promised seed of Abraham, the one through whom the blessings will come to the nation. He is also declared to be the son of David, the king par excellence in the Old Testament, and the one who was promised an eternal kingdom. And if you look down the breakdown of these three, if you look at the breakdown of these three sections, the first section ends at the time of David, the time when the kingdom of Israel was established. The second section ends at the time of exile, the point at which the kingdom was taken away. And the third section ends with Jesus, indicating that at this time, the kingdom of God is being built up again. It is being restored in Christ, the newborn king. Let's look at his birth, Jesus' birth. The restoration of the coming Messiah, the restoration that he will carry out is indicated in the command that the angel gives to Joseph. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will forgive his people from their sins. The one who fulfills God's promises restores the kingdom by reversing the effects of sin. And God fulfills his word, becoming Emmanuel. God is with us. And that this restoration is not limited only to Israel. We see right away by the fact that wise men from the east come to Bethlehem to worship the newborn king. Why? Because they recognize that he is the rightful king, 
born to be king of the Jews, chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. But the work of fulfilling God's word and carrying out the work of restoration is not easily accomplished. Satan is not easily undone. Or as we say sometimes, Satan is not a pushover. Herod, when he hears that announcement of the wise men, is so troubled that he sets in motion events that destroy many children in Bethlehem and cause the flight to Egypt. We see here a picture already in the very early days of that conflict between the two kingdoms, that conflict that will later again be shown to us in Revelation chapter 12. After Jesus' birth, and after the wise men had come, Joseph was warned by an angel to flee from Herod's jealous wrath. And the flight into Egypt, Matthew 2, 13 to 15, reminds us of several Old Testament incidents. It brings to mind Pharaoh's attempt to kill Moses when he was just a baby. Kill all the male children, Pharaoh had said. But remember how God had rescued him. The life of Moses was recognized by his parents as a special child. The one that God would use years later to redeem Israel. But when it was threatened, Moses was saved by God. Later on, when Moses was again threatened when he was 40 years old, and Pharaoh again tries to kill him, he flees out of Egypt into the desert. He spends 40 years there. Now with Jesus, there is a reversal. This time the danger is not in Egypt. The danger now is in Israel itself. Jesus, by his parents, flees to Egypt for refuge. And Jesus' flight from Israel is a parallel to Moses' flight from Egypt. The danger in Israel, the danger in Israel has become so severe that he must flee. The kingdom of God is being threatened since the life of the Redeemer is at stake because of the murderous work of Herod. And yet, Matthew indicates specifically that the flight into Egypt took place also to fulfill the prophecy of Hosea Chapter 11, verse 1, out of Egypt have I called my son. So if Hosea is telling us that's why he went to Egypt, because he's going to call my son out, how does the flight into Egypt fulfill that prophecy? The prophecy of Hosea is found in the context of a prophecy that looks back to the first exodus in order to point ahead to a new exodus and a new return from the exile in Babylon. Hosea is promising God's people back in those days that God will restore his people. And now Matthew, by pointing to Hosea chapter, by in chapter 11, Matthew reminds his readers and us that the new exodus is here. Not an exodus from slavery, but an exodus from sin. The day of redemption has come. Jesus represents the people of God and he is also the redeemer of God's people. Is it possible 
that this is also the beginning of the healing of Egypt. Remember, that was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 19. But now Egypt performs a redemptive work by saving the Christ child. We continue on to look at the baptism found in Matthew chapter 3. Baptism by John the Baptist. Now this event is recorded in all four of the Gospels, so it shows how significant it is. By his baptism, Jesus, as he passes through the water, identifies himself fully with mankind in their search for righteousness. Repent and be baptized. You need to be made whole again, was the message of John the Baptist. Now Jesus is identifying with his people. Yes, he is without sin, but he enters into the dirty waters of the Jordan where all those people had come to wash away their sins. And he goes into that water. He truly seeks to do the will of God by identifying himself with the sin and sorrow of mankind. Why? Think of Isaiah 53, a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief. He came in the world to identify himself with us, to take upon himself our sin so that we might be restored again. The ancient church father Irenaeus says it this way, he became what we are to make us what he is. Isn't that beautiful? He became what we are to make us what he is. Of course, John the Baptist objected, you will remember. And I think we can see here that Matthew already, as he was writing this gospel, understood that struggle. Why should the sinless one, why should he repent? Why should there be a sign of repentance and baptism with him? Jesus was baptized, not because he was, as I say, a sinner, but because he took on our sin. But many people have wrestled with that matter. And I think Matthew, by giving voice to John the Baptist to say, you shouldn't be baptized by me. is telling us already that he was very conscious of that struggle. And yet this is how God worked out our salvation. Jesus was baptized. And as he comes out of the water, he is declared to be the beloved son of God and is anointed by the Holy Spirit as the great high priest. This anointing by the Spirit was prophesied also by Isaiah in chapter 11, verse 2, as the way in which the stump of Jesse, the line of David, would once again be able to bear fruit. The actual citations from the Old Testament that we find here when God speaks are noteworthy. First, you are my son. This is a quotation from Psalm, chapter, Psalm 2, verse 7. Now this psalm itself was written in a time of testing in the life of David, the king of Israel. The heathen may rage and rebel, but the king has confidence in the promises of God. And this psalm was also then understood by God's people to be a messianic psalm, pointing ahead to the Savior who was to come. And as such, Jesus understands that he, the Son of God, is the true King of Israel. The second citation, with him I am well pleased, is another reference to Isaiah. Chapter 42, verse 1. It is a part of the description of the suffering servant of the Lord. The one whom Isaiah tells us back in chapter 53 will be wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. With this one, God says, I am well pleased. 
We see here in these words of God spoken at the baptism of Jesus, that while Jesus was indeed the chosen Messiah, the King, the way for him to accomplish the will of God be the way it would be the way of self-denial, obedience, and suffering. Immediately after Jesus was baptized, the scriptures tell us that he was driven by the Spirit into the wilderness. And there he endures the temptations of Satan. Matthew 4, verses 1 to 4. The scene makes a drastic shift. No longer are we talking about the Jesus who was there from the beginning, the time of the Garden of Eden. No. This Jesus, who we know now from his baptism, is indeed the King, the Son of God, the one who is beloved by him. This Jesus goes out into the wilderness the opposite of the garden. And there he too endures the temptations of Satan. We're reminded that there's this constant conflict between God and Satan. The 40 days and nights in the wilderness are an echo of Israel's past failures. Israel failed by grumbling and refusing to follow the Lord's directions, even when he sent manna in the wilderness. But Jesus, the second Adam, does not fall into the food temptation, as we so often do. That food temptation, remember the apple in the garden? That food temptation had dethroned the first Adam as God's earthly co-regent, earthly king, you could say. Jesus will not change stones to bread to fill his own belly, but he will be satisfied to eat the food of God. That is to do the will of him who had sent him into the world. This underscores the truth of Jesus as the true king. He came to fight against sin. He came to bring restoration, healing, and life. Jesus, the new Israel, obeys God faithfully and in so doing, defeats Satan. Jesus refuses to use his divine power to avoid the task of becoming a suffering servant for us. Most people wanted and still want the Messiah to be a kind of ultimate warrior, a warrior king, one who would defeat all his enemies by power. Had they forgotten the words of the Lord? Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit. But even today, people clamor for power. Build a bigger army. And when we get into trouble with somebody, we turn around and we fight with our fists, trying to show our power. Not Jesus. Now Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians that both the Jews and the Greeks sought the cross was foolishness. The Jews wanted signs. Remember the signs that Jesus had done earlier? Changing water to wine and all those things as a symbol of his power and authority. They wanted more of that. The Greeks wanted wisdom, understanding. They wanted to be able to tell you exactly the way everything was and they thought they knew the way everything was. But the cross is indeed the power of God for those who are being saved. And in Jesus, we receive true wisdom from God. Our righteousness, our holiness, and our redemption, according to Ephesians 4, verse 2. Did you notice that the tempter, 
seeks to cause Jesus to doubt his own calling. Isn't that exactly what he did also in the Garden of Eden? Making Adam and Eve doubt the word of God. Did God say you shouldn't eat any fruit of the whole garden? No. You see how already then, and already today also, Satan always works, always works to sow seeds of doubt in our mind that God is indeed the true God. That's why he said, if, if you are. He didn't say you are the son of God. No, if you are the son of God, that same temptation would come back again as Jesus hung from the cross. If you are the son of God, come down. Come down. But Jesus says, be gone. And the serpent is again subdued. The fulfillment of Genesis 3.15 has begun. It has begun. Jesus is the faithful son of God. As the true Israel, the last Adam, the one who undoes Israel's failure and brings life to his people. Read Romans 5, 12 to 21. In him, our vocational mandate is being restored. We're going to pause just for a moment there, and it might give you time to look at those scripture passages and reflect a little bit more on them.
Welcome back. We're going to continue in the following through in Matthew's Gospel by looking now at Jesus' preaching ministry. After the temptations, Jesus begins his preaching ministry by declaring that the kingdom has come. A very similar beginning to that which we saw in Mark's Gospel. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near, he says. 417 and then he goes on to preach the good news of the kingdom verse 43 that's reminiscent also of Luke chapter 4 that we have seen already he preaches in Galilee and in the Decapolis verse 25 note that immediately he did not restrict himself to Galilee but went to the Decapolis and these ten cities were outside the borders of Israel, indicating that not only the Israelites, but the other nations, the other people also are a part of Jesus' ministry from the very beginning. The promise to Abraham that the nations will be included. We have seen already starts. It started with the coming of the wise men. We see it further as Jesus preaches to the Decapolis. And as he preaches, he performs miracles, casts out demons, signs that reveal that he is truly the sovereign creator who has come to restore his kingdom by taking back the authority that Satan has wrongfully seized. As the king, Jesus ascends the mountainside. Think of Moses. And there he gives his people the law. But note in particular the opening and closing of the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 1 and 2, and 7, 28, 29. He does not receive the law as Moses did. Rather, as the king he speaks. He speaks as one who has authority. Up to this time, the law had crushed God's people, but he fulfills but now he fulfills the law for his people. He who is altogether righteous knows the Father's will and he does it completely. And in doing that, he fulfills every jot and tittle of the law. Jesus, the new lawgiver, what was the law that he gave? Sorry for pausing there for a moment because I had some distractions from outside. Maybe you heard the noise going on out there. Um, so, but I'll just speak a little louder and hopefully uh, you'll be okay. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus, as it were, I got to pause. 